I have Joe W. from Grim Philly Twilight Tours. I went to University of Pennsylvania, and I lived in Philly for many years. So I love Philly, and I love anyone from Philly. So welcome, Joe. Thank you, Jerry. And I, as well, went to that same Ivy League institution as you did. And I think that you came on one of our tours when mm -hmm. I was a professor at, at Ryder University and I put these things together. We were talking off mic a little and I was telling you, like, I dig history. I'm a history professor and I put these together, not necessarily for other people. I mean, I did for other people, but to be the way I would want to take a tour, you know, mm -hmm. with founding father traditional stuff, but also super cool, interesting, I don't know, wacky, dark things that yeah. would be different than you would normally hear. Yeah. And so not necessarily a ghost tour, but like, you know, sex in 1776 mm -hmm. and eventually some serial killers and wow. crazier aspects that you don't really hear. And then mix that with Alexander Hamilton and things like that, yeah. which is pretty cool. I bet. I bet Brent, Ben Franklin features in your stories, right? Oh, my God. Yeah. And you know what, too? We could talk, man, for like eight hours on stuff. And I could probably do an entire Ben Franklin tour because wow. he was just a uh, – Wait, I think he's my favorite founding father now that I know him a little bit better. I've researched him more. He's got a lot of great, cool quotes and it would have, you know, he would have never made it in politics today with everything that, you know, if everything you say, everything you do is scrutinized, he didn't ever made it. He was a regular average guy, but he liked to have fun. Yeah. Yeah. And he said a lot of stuff that could be construed as controversial <laughs> in addition to having a lot of fun. I know he did yeah. too. Yeah, but I mean, he, he brewed beers, he talked about his ladies, and he liked older ladies because, well, well, well I could get into this, right? I could talk yeah, about please. a little bit of the tour factoids. Yeah, he liked older ladies because he said, you know, it's, it's kind of a win-win-win. Like, first of all, I, they can have better conversations, they've been around longer, and they're more fun to hang out with and talk mm. to. But also, they've been around longer in the bedroom, so it's oh. also more fun there, too because they've been around longer and they know what they like and they know what you like. And thirdly, they can't get pregnant. So that was a big <laughs> important thing back then. And, and we're looking at Ben Franklin, right? Yeah. Today, to our standards, he's not like the hottest guy ever, yeah. right? He but was back quite then, big, right? But that was hot back then. For guys oh. to be big, it meant that you could feed yourself, you had money. And so, oh. hey, he could feed himself, he could totally feed me, right? He's got money. It shows off your, your, you know, your, your, your economic status. We don't think about that stuff back then. You were supposed to have like big calves to put your best foot forward. There were different beauty standards in different times. Yeah. You know, wow. I mean, it used to be way back in the day. If you go to the Victorian era, man, they wanted pale skin. Yeah. yeah. Now we're all, we're all getting tanned today. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that meant if you were tan, you were, you know, you had to work out in the fields or yeah. something, you know, exactly. and, you know, you were so, a worker. <laughs> something I've always wondered is, you know, uh, in that, uh, founding fathers here, they're all wearing wigs, right? So in the bedroom, yeah. are they taking off their wigs or do they do like oh, do yeah. it with their wigs on? <laughs> nah. <laughs> That's something cool to think about, right? Yeah. Nah, I'm sure they took them off. Mm -hmm. okay. But yeah, yeah. No, man, they paid a lot of money for those things too. Yeah. When they had a powder room, they were the cheap ones. You bought the wigs if you wanted it to, to have the powdered look and not to have to powder it. It was a lot more expensive. Like Marie Antoinette's wig, all oh, can I, can, can I say mother fuck that was expensive as wow. hell I don't know if you let you know oh it's am fine I cool? I mean, am I, am I, am I cool not monetized to... yet so it's fine all right so I can cuss and yeah, we can cuss, talk yeah. like adults <laughs> <laughs> um when did you start Grim Philly Twilight Tours I started it in two well I was researching it in like all of 2010 just on the side I started it on my own in 2011 and I was like the only guy I did, you know, the website, I was the tour guide, there was no substitute if I had the cold or something, I had to show up and do things, I answered the emails, I remember occasionally people would email and be like, oh my god, the tour guide had a cold and still did, mm -hmm. I'm emailing them back, I'm sorry I had the cold, you know, cold or <laughs> the flu or something, I mean, god forbid I should have a flu now with what's going on, you know, mm -hmm. we could never do the things. You know, it's crazy, this whole new virus world that we live in is absolutely unexpected i think for a lot of industries but the tourism industry especially it's oh, been hit like crazy i mean god if i had a cruise ship it'd be even worse yeah. right or a hotel i'd have property you know to pay for or a cruise ship to pay off 
uh, at least with us, we have a little bit less overhead, you know, yeah. and we're hoping to weather the storm. There's not a whole hell of a lot of bailout, though, by the government. I mean, they're giving the um, they're giving the airlines and, and, you know, some of the bigger corporations are, you know, recipients of some stuff, man. God, we got a paycheck protection program loan that yeah. was like four thousand fucking dollars was Ugh. what we got yeah. i'm like oh my god that's like three weeks of bills jeez, jeez. thanks guys and, you know and then was that the good thing i'm 50 the years SBA, old or was that a little different uh yes uh the well i could get this loan or whatever the small business they grant. Off, they offered me like 75 grand like right after that at like regular interest rates <laughs> and oh. I, I was like i was like well i guess i'll have to take that right yeah. <laughs> i guess i really don't have a choice if mm. i don't want to like completely go under i'll try to pay it off as quickly as possible but yeah you know it's like a 30-year thing you know so it's just a regular and as soon as they uh, because i asked for obviously I asked for more yeah. and just for the ppp and as soon as they were like no well actually they said no to me the first time like no you don't even get one mm -hmm. and they reallocated the, the government some more funds and in the second round, they were like, yeah, okay, we'll give you this little tiny pittance. We'll give you that. Wow. Uh, and when they did, as soon as they did, they – I didn't even ask. They increased my credit card um, limit so that I could put more on my credit card for what I wasn't actually able to pay, I guess, myself. Then later, I, from what I understand, other business owners have had the same thing. They just offered us loans at regular – regular rates and you know i mean i don't want to lose my house man i get a mortgage i get kids right so yeah. wow. you know i was like yeah okay i'll take that yeah <laughs> wow. it'll, it'll it'll keep me off the streets right and yeah. it will bounce back eventually i mean we will get a vaccine eventually whenever that happens yeah to be um i think it's awful weird and and conspicuous i i, I was getting my hair cut and my hairdresser's one that told me this i i, I just I'm, I'm sick of watching the the tv and stuff like that sometimes but uh, she was like, yeah, man, they're supposed to come out with a vir um, a, uh, a vaccine for like November and then it tested in January. And I'm like, you know, that's awful conspicuous with like coinciding with the election, isn't it? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that at the election is when we're going to have it. That's to like politicized. I yeah, don't know. Yeah. I'm not all about it's, the politics. It's so of things. politicized, man. Wow. It um, really is, man. We should just be looking at the help each other is what yeah. it is, you know? Yeah. And, you know, um, connecting this to the tours, Joe, I wanted to ask during that period, that founding period, and even before during the colonies period, did they have any epidemics like this? Oh, hell yeah. We had the yellow fever happened, Ooh. broke all up and down the, the East Coast. It coincided with the Haitian Revolution, right? The Haitian oh. Revolution happens, and you got all these people all of the former slaves because it was the most successful slave uprising in all history mm -hmm. the people who were enslaved started their own republic you know it was mm -hmm. fucking beautiful right yeah. all these whites are fleeing to a lot of them went to new orleans because of the language commonality but a lot of them went to philadelphia we were the capital of the united mm -hmm. states at the time biggest of the colonies um biggest of the cities in the colonies and all up and down the, the East Coast, though, because they went to, you know, South Carolina, North Carolina, New York. They went all over the place and brought the yellow fever. Wow. And the yellow fever was like 1791 to 1793. It kept breaking out. And mosquitoes were what spread it. So when the frost hit, it would kill the mosquitoes. And it would oh. go away for the winter. Oh. And then it would come back. And people were like, why does it come back? And they were trying to figure that out. I guess like we're trying to figure viruses out today. Mm -hmm. They were a little bit more rudimentary about it. And they didn't put it together that mosquitoes were what was causing it. Mm -hmm. But they were they somehow put together that if you smoked cigars, it seemed to be healthier for you. And it Ooh. did drive mosquitoes away, right? Uh -huh. And if you exploded a lot of gunpowder, it seemed to keep it away too. I guess it kept mosquitoes away. Yeah. And I don't know. It's, it's interesting though, but a lot of people died. And obviously there's no penicillin. There's none of the medical stuff that we have today. Nobody was, I mean, viruses, well, as far as vaccines go, there were, you know, rudimentary sort of thing. Basically what you would do is you would take the virus and you would cut you, you just put an actual cut on your arm and, and put it right in. Give it oh, to I've heard about purpose. that, yeah. It was a little dangerous. I mean, it would kill probably 10% of the people that did that. 
but you'd know that you'd get it and you try to put a weaker form of it in the, you know, the doctors would do that. I'm not a medical historian, but I've mm-hmm. read a lot of the medical stuff from the period, mm-hmm. which seems to us as wacky today, but it mm-hmm. well, you know, back then they, they were figuring things out. It wasn't yeah. necessarily wacky to them because yeah. they didn't know what to do. They were figuring it out. Wow. And something that I learned you know, I don't know if it was on your tour. It was on, I, it's been so many years, but I, I felt like I've done a bunch of tours. But one thing I learned is George <clears throat> Washington, our brilliant first president, you know, he did a lot of great, but one thing he didn't do well was that he snuck his slaves across the Mason Dixon line to Philadelphia, where slavery was not happening at the time. So he hid his slave underground. And if you go to the Liberty Bell now, there's right next door, there's like where, Washington lived and they still have the, they, they dug it up maybe only 10 years ago. They found it out. But so um, tell me more about that. Do you show you learned that, that on our part? tour? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You learned that from us. Okay, uh, That's yeah. what I learned. Washington. Yeah. They found his slave quarters and mm-hmm. they have the foundation of it. They show it and they've got the names of all the nine slaves that they brought that he brought from Mount Vernon with him. Mm-hmm. carved onto this granite wall, you know, so that we could see their names. And this wasn't something that they put there recently with all of the social unrest that's going on now. It's something that they did when they discovered it in mm-hmm. 1999. They, they were like, oh my God. Yeah. They were like, George Washington had his fucking slaves in a free state. What's going on with that? And Washington, it was more Martha argued with him mm-hmm. about it, right? Because Martha was like the most wealthy widow in Virginia, right? George found her by perusing the obituary columns for the rich guys that died, mm-hmm. and the rich widows that'd be left holding the bag. So George had money, but Martha had more money than God, man. And when they went to Philly, Martha was like, man, I'm not going anywhere without my servants, by mm-hmm. which she met her slaves. And George was like, man, slaves, baby, living under the Liberty Bell, not a bad PR move, you don't think. And like most of us guys, though, we give in to our ladies when they put up a significant argument. He does. Now their names are all carved into this wall. You can see the foundation there. They have reenactments of his slaves looping on TVs, like you know the modern museum way of doing things yeah. is to incorporate electronics and, uh, and visuals and sound, and, and they're looping it all day, sometimes 24 hours. Uh, I think they're supposed to turn it off sometime in the middle of the night, but sometimes they don't. And it is uh, probably something he would have put his foot down about had had he known that that would happen. But we had the Gradual Emancipation Act here, which it's got loopholes. It said if you were black and you were here in Pennsylvania six months, you you had to be 28 years old, uh, you were free. Mm-hmm. It didn't say anything about being here for 975,000 times for five and a half months each time. He, he would send them back to Mount Vernon. You just leave and cross back over to state border, and the clock starts all over again. And you're a slave, right? Even if they didn't actually keep to that, right? I mean, you know, Washington's or any slave owners, their word is going to be taken over somebody that's not – that under the Dred Scott decision is uh, just – is a piece of property yeah. is how they looked at that you know, like a table or a chair. It's a crazier time, you know, and people are asking a lot about this stuff nowadays on the tours. And we say, you know, it's, it's a really complex time. Washington was a, if I could say this, a motherfucker, when you escaped, he would hunt you down. And there's not a record of what would happen to you, but you can imagine, right. But in his will, He's the only founding father that did free all of his slaves. Yeah. He did that. Jefferson talked about it. Madison talked about doing it. Others had these grand ideas. It would be like, I don't know how Mackenzie Bezos gave away half her money, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the form of wealth in the South. And it's it's a complex situation. It's a complex. Mm-hmm. It's a different time outside of our time. So – you know, he's a motherfucker in ways. And then in another way, like he, he did give them all their freedom and yeah. Martha. Oh my God. Yeah. She doesn't free her slaves. Wow. Their slaves remained separate property wow. throughout the marriage because Martha was a widow and her slaves remained hers and George's remained his. They intermarried, you know, it's natural. 
Mm-hmm. And so if I was, say, George's slave and my wife was Martha's and I got free and my wife didn't, I wasn't going to go anywhere. Oh. My life my life wouldn't have changed. I mean, my kids are still there. I'm not going to leave. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a tragic situation. It's a yeah. whole different time period that, you know, as a historian, we try to wrap our minds around the way people think back then, you mm-hmm. know, and obviously a lot of people, you know, there were a lot of abolitionists, people didn't like it. And then there's a power structure at the same time, like we have today, yeah. you know, I mean, people don't think about how, much corporations maybe out of self-interest control a lot of things yeah. well back then that was the equivalent of what they had as a corporation they controlled a lot of things mm-hmm. and the average person may not have liked it but it was how it was and it was sort of almost taken for granted and it's tragic when you look back on it but it's you know the reality of 1776 life wow. you know and philly's and philly's cool because it was like the you know, the stop, first stop for the Underground Railroad, too. Harry Tubman was, was bringing people there, made a bunch of trips. And it was, uh, you know, there were a lot of people. There was a community of folks that were there to help. And with the largest black population that was free in the United States, in Philadelphia. Wow. But they had to police their own communities because people from the South would just come up and snatch people of color off the street, whether they were free or not. And kidnap them down to the south and say, all right, I captured a slave. And when you're down there, hey, you're in the south. Yeah, you know, exactly. So they had to police their own neighborhoods because they knew that that would happen and would try to prevent it. So we're proactive about it. Um, you know, difficult times yeah. for a lot yeah. of people. The fur- I, I tell all my classes, the further back you go, the shittier people treated one another. Yep. Yep. Very true. Very true. Um, I love what you said about just, you got to step into the shoes of the time. Sometimes it's, it's easy to judge something based on what we know now, but you have to remember that back then, you know, especially if you, if the time period we're talking about, we didn't even have vaccines yet. Right. Some people probably nope. still thought the world is flat. Although people now <laughs> still think the world is flat, but you know, back then there's probably the earth is round was re- still really in dispute. Even though Columbus sailed, you know, Magellan sailed Fucking all the way around. Sea monsters. Yeah. You go fall off the end of the world and there'll be sea monsters yeah. out there. So it's like, you have to, to look say. at, you have to look at things from that era and still give them credit for some of the progress they made, man. Yeah. I think, well, we make baby steps. I think yeah. that I get frustrated with the, Uh, progress that we make like it's not fast enough but we do make progress i guess slow progress every generation there's progress in how we as humans how we treat you know ourselves others that are humans in this world (laughs) with us our technologies get better and hopefully that improves things you know but it's always like a mixed sort of thing you know i teach history and uh the the egyptians ancient egyptians used to always say Nothing is truly positive and or truly negative. There's a little bit of positive in things that are negative and vice versa. And in a way, it's kind of the way like the Tao is too. And people in China were saying a very similar thing. There needs to be a mix of these positives and negatives. And they didn't see it in terms of a Judeo-Christian sort of uh, sin or something like that. They didn't even have a word to translate to that in Egyptian. But there are peoples across the globe that have come up with quite similar ideas, very separate from one another. And we just recognize that, you know, sometimes when something good happens, there's a little, there, it's not, comp- there's nothing that's completely, it's not black and white. Yeah. You know, there's nothing completely good, completely bad, you know, but it's, I don't know, food for thought. Yep. And, you know, food for thought. I want to ask you this, Joe, what, what, area of history did you specialize in when you studied at Penn? Well, I did Roman history originally, but obviously nobody wants to take a tour of ancient Rome in Philadelphia, which is where I'm at. So I wind up now knowing quite a bit more about Philadelphia history than anything else. And I kept it always like small in in a way. I, I never like the, I don't know, like when you take these big franchise 
tour companies and there's nothing wrong with them you know kudos to them they make some big bucks but the ones that are in all the different cities you lose that little bit of a personal touch yeah. i think and so i've always tried to keep a close knit group of like awesome people like if i'm not doing it myself somebody really fucking good is doing the tour mm -hmm. somebody that's a professor or like they have to have history degrees and most of us are history professors or history high school history teachers i get some of them and whoever the best ones are get the most tours and the most people see them because that's what I want. I want the most awesome people to be seen by the most people and everybody to get a really good kind of personal, you know, human, genuine experience from not just somebody local. I mean, you could have somebody local anywhere, but somebody who knows their shit yeah. and somebody that's into this whole like little dark thing too because you get the whole founding father stuff we hit the liberty bell independence hall the national banks we hit all the sites of 1776 places that were occupied by british troops places where ben franklin was drinking but ben franklin's house you know alexander hamilton's house george washington's house we go to where fucking benedict arnold lived we go to all these places that are connected in a huge way historically but then we're like hey there's, there's there's these other things that happen too and we don't have kids on our tours so i'll speak the way i'm speaking to you right now mm -hmm. where i'm using a little bit more colorful language because we're adults right yeah. it, there's yeah. no kids on the tour we can speak like adults and we can learn adult subjects and i can say there was a fucking whorehouse right here and this is what was going on there and these are the founding fathers that went there that we know about from what was written in their diaries and they got feed d and what do you do penicillin's not invented until 1944 what do you do when you get syphilis you're stuck with it how mm. do you handle that for the rest of your life how does that play out for you and everybody who you have intimate relations with after that too and we talk about a lot of that stuff because i find it is not the thing that we teach in history class because these aren't the events that change the world you know you know the, the nations of the world have not turned and and risen and fallen based on i you know i don't know benjamin franklin or alexander hamilton having cheated on their spouses or you know governor morris having contracted syphilis and, and done crazy fucking things crazy crazy things uh we we try to flesh out the the interesting stuff we tell you the things that moved nations and then within it, we pepper it with cool shit that entertains, I think, as uh, much as it I look up this influence. Governor Morris person. Sounds fascinating. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna uh, to cool. him in the description. He had a peg leg, and he was a ladies' man. It's, uh, that says it all, I think. That's amazing. He must have been a good talker. <laughs> or, you know, he must have had some, a lot of size down there or something. <laughs> yeah, well, his family, I, I mean, he's, you know, without getting too much into him, he came from New York. He lived in Philly for like 20 years. He was a mm -hmm. senator in New York. He came down to Philly, uh, was a congressman for us. But his family sided with the British, and he didn't want the reputation of that in New York. Everybody just associated with him with, siding with the british since his family did and they were rich but he came down here and he just I, he, he liked the ladies he liked the ladies every bit as much as benjamin franklin liked the ladies mm. but awesome. yeah i'm saving a i'm saving a couple of juicy tidbits for yeah, that Yeah, totally tour. so when people you take the come tours out to or, those tours you'll or, have those or um i actually might put this on my history channel too so i'm probably gonna put this in two places so guys oh. um if joe I, I found his YouTube channel. If Joe puts some videos up, maybe he can expand on some of these on his YouTube channel. So Oh, I'll post it as an, well. That's yeah. an idea for you. Yeah, I'll definitely post this. Yeah, yeah. So um, potentially, if you guys want expanded stories of some of these, um, Joe could tell some of that on his channel. I'll link his channel in the description and pinned comments. Cool, cool. And we've got also, we just came out with a podcast too, oh. which is, it's less Philadelphia and more the world. Mm -hmm. I figured, I know all of these cool, crazy, smart, and like half crazy people, and let's do a podcast. Mm -hmm. And what I started to do, actually, it just kind of fell into my lap. I was traveling Europe over the winter before mm -hmm. COVID broke out. And I, I you know, I, I took this like short term consulting job over in Europe and I was hitting all these different cities and I thought all right, I'm gonna be there anyway let me line up interviews with cool people mm. and so I interviewed people like all through Europe 
I just went on one about cool, interesting things that, well, things that I thought were pretty cool. And so that's the foundation of it. You know, we're, you know, I go to London and, you know, we hit like where Jack the Ripper killed people. I go to Scotland and I go to like where they burned witches. Wow. And I talk to people that are experts in things like espionage and, you know, political assassinations that are going on right now today mm -hmm. and just the craziest cool topics. I, I sat and drank a, well, a half a bottle of scotch with a, a historian of the Holocaust. And we just wow. we talked about the Holocaust for a couple of hours and it was, it was a heavy topic. And I do a lot of things like that. I got home, I interviewed, uh, I got an interview with uh, a Senator, a Congressman and somebody from the Obama White House. Mm. And so I'll, I'll do a couple of things on politics. I'll do a whole lot on history. It's, it's called History X. And it's mm. historyx.global, not com, dot global, historyx.global. But it'll be like extreme histories, history X, extreme histories. And we will talk about crazy shit like serial killers and things like that too. Uh, now that I'm not traveling, I'll sit down with some of our guides and I'll try to touch on some of the things that we know, but expand it outside of Philly. I don't want it to be a Philadelphia podcast. Mm. I want it to be what we do in Philly, but with the world. Instead well, I know what I'm going to be listening up. to today when I do my videos. So guys, I will put a link to that too. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Get into the podcast world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of competition now. Michelle Obama just started a podcast. I don't know if I could compete with her, but no. <laughs> I think during the pandemic, everybody was, you know, kind of in their houses and a lot of celebs started them, which is, yeah. uh, which is cool. I was starting mine already, but I'm like one guy. I don't have a team of people. So, well, um, you know, the, from like the my tours, experience it'll take, it'll online, take I'll just say that's what I always thought too. But then, you know, I, I my, my channel, one of my channels competes with full teams that cover MMA. You know, I'm just one guy and some of my cool. great friends like Rob helped me, but like I'm not a full team. So don't, don't ever sell one person short, man. If you learn from history, if, if you're a Jared diamond guy, you might not believe in like the one great man type of interpretation. But I think most historians realize that the individual plays a big role in history. I think so. Yeah. Certain individuals have huge impact. Uh, we as people, you know, I just, you know, I, I like to do my thing. I like to be creative. It's just, it's just me. It's just my drive. But yeah, I mean, there are, there are people that have made like massive impacts and there, there are some people, you know, if you look at like Confucius, you know, yeah. he didn't really think he amounted to much, but he, I, he affected like everything, you yeah. know, the whole educational system in China, everything like that they value kind of because, you know, they didn't have universities yet. And when they started university training they were like well this is good stuff you huh. know hard work keep educating yourself your entire life don't take anybody's word for it respect your elders authority and be proactive in things like these are all really super cool things yeah and so you know it, it lays the foundation for like well like you know two thousand more than two thousand years of stuff to come and yeah or my he, favorite he died without knowing Smith. that kind of like you adam smith didn't the think wealth he of too much, man. He wrote Wealth of Nations in his mom's or grandma's basement or something like that. <laughs> and, but our entire this whole this whole like crony capitalism, I mean, it, it all took inspiration from him, although he would probably turn over in his grave seeing what capitalism yeah. became. But you know, so yeah, people, everyone watching this, man, this is great. I'm glad we're talking about this. Everyone can make a difference. You know, I think don't try to make a difference but you will be making a difference just doing what you want to do. That's the key. Don't try to make a difference, but just whatever you do, you will make a difference. I think that's how I would phrase it. Yeah. Just speak your mind, be proactive. Yeah. Don't sit back and just yeah. engage with other people and let your, let your feelings be known. Exactly. Exactly. So let's talk about now. I mean, I know that unfortunately under the lockdown, it's a little hard for everyone. You guys have started podcasts. What is next for you guys? Are you guys going to do more podcasts? Are you guys going to maybe do virtual tours where let's say you walk around with the camera and people live stream in and tune in or something? What's the plan now? I, I was thinking about the whole live stream stuff and 
you know, the virtual tours. I know a lot of the European tour companies are doing that. Mm -hmm. And I like, like, you know, like you, I'm, I'm one guy, right? So I don't have all the time in the world to do everything. And I wind up doing a lot of this stuff myself. So mm -hmm. the podcast has been pretty time consuming and I'm putting my time into that. Mm -hmm. And I, what well, you know, that's totally a free, I'm actually paying. It's not just free for people to listen to. I'm actually paying not wow. just my time, but you know, to host things. I mean, I mean, obviously uh, to get that going, but you know, I'm putting that together as the main sort of side project, but I'm just really, we, we were allowed to begin doing tours again, at least by the government. doesn't mean that people are traveling, you know, yeah. Europeans are staying away and we, you know, we get a lot of people moving around within the United States. A lot of like Southerners will come to Philadelphia a lot of times under normal conditions because we're the, you know, the home of Liberty where it all started and we're, we're historic and we wind up getting people that are into history and appreciate that, but people just aren't traveling. Yeah. I mean, the volume of travel, it's, it's wow. Wow. Almost all of my tour guides have not worked for like nine months. And because wow. we don't work too often in the winter, we run things in the winter, but it's crazy that the slowest time of year for us when it's freezing cold outside in like January was busier than it is right now. And it's wow. supposed to be our busy season. We had university groups and, and, and school groups, high school groups and such that had booked well ahead because we have professors that do the tours, so a lot of university and school groups will get us to do things for them, and they'll book well in advance. And uh, you know, it, I, you know, we can't keep their money, man. If we're, you know, there's a virus going on, their their kids aren't coming. I, we we have no. to give it back. That's the fair thing to do. So yeah, and, and we, you know, so we had to refund everybody all wow. of this, and we're we're just our guides are still out of work. I got a couple of people that do a little bit for like whoever signs up, you know, if two people sign up, I'm like, yeah, go ahead. We'll lose money on two people, but whatever, you know, maybe more people will come. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, but just, just go out and do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping maybe we'll get a little bit of people like in the fall, like this week, I don't know, for some reason this week picked up a little bit, but it was more like the weekend picked up sort of, I know people are going down the shore in New Jersey mm -hmm. and it seems to be pretty much business as as usual down there. I don't know. I don't know what I think about that. Uh, as as a guy that you know lacks income, I kind of want to see the income, you know, there. But I, I at the same time, I you know I don't want people to die from this thing. I, you know, if they told me to shut down 100, percent I'd be all for it. I'd say let's shut down 100. percent Let's lock down like like crazy lockdown and make this thing go away and and then open back up. You know, after you know, we do some good with it, but it yeah. seems that, that this whole, you know, it's, it's a half thing. We're that not just is a half thing. They don't understand. Like when you take your antibiotics, what do you do? You take them to their full regimen. You don't quit halfway through. Right. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's almost like we should have either just like crazy lockdown for like three weeks. Nobody leave the house. You know, Amazon comes and delivers food. And that's the stimulus check. You get some food or something, you know, yeah. for three weeks, just locked down like crazy and then open everything back up or just do nothing. Yeah. I don't know, but that's, that's kind of terrible because like, you know, my parents would die, you know, like, like everybody older would probably wind up getting it and dying. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, there is no right answer. I think uh, it's just, you know, something that kind of blindsided us and we're figuring it out as we go along. I'm not a scientist, so I'm just I'm just a small business owner that's seriously getting hammered under this whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I but you know, as soon as it broke out, we shut our tours right down right away immediately. You know, we want to be socially responsible to everybody. We won't run our pub crawls this year. We do his we do food tours and drinking tours with history and we mm -hmm. shut all those down because we were like, Well, we'll be inside of places. Yeah. And there's going to be germs, you know, there are people who are going to be touching glasses and chairs yeah. and tables and using the bathroom. So we only run the ghost tours that are outside the history tours that are outside their paperless check-in. Nobody has to touch anything. They can distance one another. Our guides all wear masks. Everybody has masks on. Um, and it's, it's the safest open air tour environment that we have. So that's 
us being as responsible as we can, at least to do our part in it. But like I said, yeah, the government says we can run, so we'd be as responsible as we can be while we do that. Uh, it just, it's just crazy though, because you know, there are not very many people come out. I don't even have to try to keep the tour small. They just are. If they even run at all, you know, there's like four people maybe, you know, we're, we're, we're thrilled to death. If we get six people on a Saturday, we're thrilled that we had six people, you know, cause you get distance six people just fine too. Wow. Um, how do you balance what you do with like your history being a history professor. Are there ever times where you have to spend more time being a history professor than doing your tours or is it very balanced? Well, when I started this, I was adjuncting, you know, I was teaching part time at like three colleges. And what I did was I, I didn't really expect the tours to do as well as it did. I was just looking at it like, Oh, I'll just walk people around in the summer once a week. I mean, I really had some seriously, modest expectations. I just thought, well, you know, I'll just put a website together. And I'll walk around once a week in the summer when I'm not teaching as often was the plan. And when all these people started to come, I was like, oh my God, like, what is this? This is, it was shocking that all these people found my weird, dark, out of the box, unusual sense of humor and macabre interesting the way I did. And I guess it's because you learn a lot of stuff and you see a lot of stuff, but then it's got all of these crazy elements peppered through it. And maybe that was, well, I mean, obviously that was what it was. Um, but I started to teach less because I, I, I was having a hard time keeping up with it myself. The next year I just brought on, I asked colleagues to in the history department, you know, hey, can you guys help out? I could use other smart people to, to help out and do these things. And I want to give a good quality product. And that's kind of the angle that I took. I took it from the standpoint of being a professor and doing things very thoroughly, but not boring. Not like, you know, oh, you got to take a test and let's get all these you know, every single stupid little fact, if they're not mm. stupid, but, but every, every single little fact, you know, let's just hit the best stuff, the craziest stuff. And, uh, but make it be people that you can ask questions mm. to that do the tour so that they can answer whatever you have. It's not really scripted so much as that, but I stopped teaching as much as I was before. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but yeah, I stopped teaching as much as I was before. I kind of cut that down a little mm. bit. So I was never tenure track. Otherwise, I'd probably not have started these tours if yeah. I wasn't looking for a couple more bucks. And pleasantly, I was surprised, then came to rely on it. Then a virus broke out. And now I'm like, ooh, what do I do now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then wow. I just did this European thing where I was working over there. And it was with a tour company that I was consulting with. And they were like, yeah, hey, man, you did great work, but there's a virus now. And, uh, you know, if you wanted to do that again in like two years from now, mm -hmm. that would be cool. I'm like, ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what the, uh, that's what we think though. We think about two years is maybe the recovery. Yeah. You know, next year, maybe something will happen better than right now. Yeah, but exactly. It, Just think better, it's, but it's not going to be back to normal next year. Definitely not. No, as soon as we get a virus, uh, as soon as we get something, uh, you know, to take as, as far as uh, a shot for it and we could get ourselves immune, that would be good. But we'll just, you know, we're taking it one day at a time. Yeah. We'll just do yeah. what we got to do. Wow. Um, being a history professor and now a really cool history tour guide, what are some of your top history books or history, historical documentaries, movies, et cetera? Oh, oh my God. All right. So I uh, did you see it's uh, – I think it's on Netflix. It's called The Great. It's Catherine. It's about Catherine the Great. I can't recommend it any more high. So it's a oh, series. Oh, the one with Elle Fanning. I don't know her name, but that maybe, maybe, maybe. But it's it's funny as hell, okay? Mm. Like like my wife, who doesn't like to watch TV with me because I'm always like, oh, that's inaccurate. You know, like I'm always, mm. you know, picking what they do apart. I'm like, oh, they could have just looked that up or, you know, had a consultant, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm watching it. It's hilarious. They're cussing. It's hilarious. And I'm like – 
no way. Because, I mean, Russian history, as far as Russian history goes, I, I had one Russian history class way back when I was an undergrad, like a zillion years ago. But I'm recognizing things that they're saying in it as completely accurate as stuff wow. that I learned like way back when. But they're making it hilarious. They're just like having sex, killing people, and but making it funny. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's dark comedy. But there's like factually accurate stuff in it. Not that the whole thing is factually accurate, but the there's so much factually accurate stuff that for a history buff, it's it's like intellectual pornography. It's so great. I love it. Wow. Yeah. So the so the great as a series that's new, I would recommend that highly. Cool. Uh, I always I always like the series Rome. Way back, oh the, that uh, one, yes. The first season, very accurate, really good. Uh, the second season, they kind of threw caution to the wind and just <laughs> screwed it all up. Not very accurate at all. I, I don't know if the writers changed or they were just like, oh, it's a hit. Let's just, you know, rest on our laurels and write whatever the fuck we want now. It doesn't have to be accurate in any way. <laughs> Let's mix together like four different emperors into this one guy yeah. and make it all crazy. But yeah, the second season lost me. But the first season of Rome was was really good. Uh, I mean, obviously they make it for Hollywood, and they you know they throw love stories in there, and they they do all that stuff. There was not even any such thing as romantic love back in Roman times. We didn't get that till like the year one thousand A.D. I think we get that from like the French. The age of chivalry and all of that. That's when we start to think about, oh, you know, oh, I got a soulmate out there, maybe, and <laughs> and let's let's be romantic. The Romans were just like, nah, no, nah, no, nah, procreation. You know, yep. that's what it's all about. We have a low birth rate, and you know, I don't know. Interesting, interestingly, they had a low birth rate. See, this is where my brain goes. They thought that sperm was brain fluid, and oh. that ejaculating made them stupid, so they tried not to actually ejaculate when they had sex so they had a low birth rate what? by extension so that yeah, was part of the reason huh yeah it was the fall of rome right it, it wasn't what? the lead in the utensils yeah it wasn't the lead it wasn't the cutting the the, the diluting their silver content you know inflation it was actually that they, they didn't have sex that's crazy no nah, there was a lot of pro- there was a lot of problems obviously you know yeah <laughs> there's uh you know people have wrote series on that thing you know yeah but the superstition of losing brain cells from you know having <laughs> sex doesn't help so wow someone must have bashed someone's brains out and been like i know what that is uh... <laughs> <laughs> man wow there's a okay, lot of so, interesting little tidbits you know yeah i will link all of those um, in the description too. Um, I actually did some research on the show Rome and the reason uh, why the second season was so bad was because originally I think they wanted more than two seasons. So they literally had to squeeze a lot of stuff into the second season that was supposed to be spread oh, over three that more seasons. Did? That's why the second season seems so just completely just out of nowhere. It was an expensive set that they built too. Mm-hmm. I, I heard that they were spending more money. I read somewhere that they spent more money on the set and the costumes and all the production side of it than they were getting out of it. And mm-hmm. The money was the reason that they kind of stopped it. But I guess the money that they put into it made the quality. Yeah, it really made the first season insanely good. Yeah, it did. Wow. Wow, man. Um, Yeah, the fact that you study Roman history, I subscribe to the Ancient Rome subreddit. So I I love Roman history too, especially looking at it now. And it's there's certain parallels to it, but there's, uh, well, we're going through in it, but it's also like my experience looking both at Western Rome and Eastern Rome is that you just wanted to grab them and shake them sometimes. It's like, Stop repeating the same mistakes, man. Come on. <laughs> it's like they literally, Eastern Rome after Western Rome fell, the Byzantine Emperor was still like doing the same exact stupid stuff. It's like, what? Why did you learn for the past like 500 years? Dude, you're, the Western half of your brethren already fell. Why did you learn from them? It's just, uh, that's, that's, that's well, they, Roman history is so frustratingly interesting. I know. And they were so preoccupied with, for a little while, trying to reconquer the West. Yes. And they, put all the money and resources into that it was crazy and it was like the relationship with the west is the reason that 
the Byzantine Empire fell, they asked the Pope for some help, and which sparks off the Crusades. I think yeah. it was uh, Alexis Comenius was like, hey, man, you know, one of the urbans, urbanists, I, I forget, but he asked the Pope, can you send me like maybe a thousand guys, you know, to help fight these, these guys, like in the name of, of Christendom, let's, let's fight Islam together and give me like a thousand guys maybe that I could control. And the Pope was like, yeah, no, I'm going to get power in the East by, you know, the influence. And he sent like, you know, a call out for help and he sent him like 60,000 guys. Yeah. And it was like a power play yeah. really, you know, because the Pope in the West wanted supremacy and the, one in the east was, you know, the emperor in the east was more powerful, more prestigious, more yeah. wealthy, actually, and was the primary one because they moved over to the east where the wealth actually was, yeah. had been historically. So it was that antagonism kind of between them. And then you have in the Fourth Crusade, Venetian uh, seamen, basically like kind of pirates, you know, like just kind of confounding the whole thing. And they sack Constantinople, yeah. Yeah. you know, like it, it, it'd be like, I don't know. England asking America for help because the Nazis are bombing them and Americans in London are like, you know, those Nazis are scary fucking people. That would be super hard to actually fight them, but we're right in London. We could steal all this shit. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of the same way, right? Yeah, so 1204 yeah. Constantinople falls and you've got like 60 years it takes them to recover from that. Yeah. And the West really directly leads to the fall of the Byzantine Empire. Yeah. And Europe, really, if the Byzantine Empire wasn't there, for better or worse, it would have just been different, yeah. right? It, it would have been Islamic mm. hadn't the Byzantine Empire actually been there. People don't think about that, yeah. you know? That, you know, I don't know, all, all these, day, the different events, the different, well, that's not just one event, you know, but the different things in the world that if things were different, the outcome for people a hundred or a thousand years later would be different. Yeah. And it would just be different. It wouldn't be better or worse. Yeah. It would just be yeah. different. And we, and we would just be like, Oh, okay, this is the way it is. You yeah. Know? And I, I, one of the things since we're in current COVID times, when the East Eastern Roman empire was busy trying to reconquer a lot of the West, when they reached one of their fullest extents of reconquest, a plague struck too. <laughs> it's like a disease. There right? were, I think it killed yeah. off the half, half of the Byzantine population or something crazy, that plague. Yeah, there were plagues. The second and third century had loads yeah. of plagues, and it was it was one of the things that led to the fall of Rome was yeah, the plagues. Yeah, the, it was and crazy. So you, you, think, you think about all that. Like you said, like, what if things went different? What if there was no plague that the, the one plague I'm thinking about, which one? It could have been the Justinian plague or something. I don't know which one it was. But, uh, you know, what if there was no plague? Would the Byzantine Empire have fared better? You just never know. But, you know, history works a certain way. People are people. People are kind of dumb. We're mostly dumb people. <laughs> <laughs> We're selfish sometimes. We look yeah. at what's in front of us instead yeah. of long term. I think if people, just, just in general, like in our own lives even, I mean, for nations or for individuals, if we think about things a little bit more long term, yeah, it makes more sense. Like, where will this society of ours in general be down the road? Instead of, oh, what's in front of me? What can I get for myself at this yeah. very moment? Yeah. And with our own lives, it's the same, right? Yeah. Instead of, oh, what can I get for myself that's very selfish for me today or this year? Where am I going to be in 10 years? Yeah. Where will the road lead me to if I make these decisions versus those decisions? And you know, as individuals or, or nations, I think it's something to think about just the ramifications of your actions or inactions and where you see yourself best being at a future point. But we, we, you know, we don't always do that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Dude, I think this is a good place to just uh, stop the talk. I think we went over a lot of good stuff and it was fun, man. Yeah, it was this fun. was really fun. Man. I actually just realized I wrote this down in case I forgot. I actually had one more Philly question for you so i heard you know ben franklin founded i think one of the first firefighting squads or whatever like um a public firefighting squad so i heard before he did that it was like com competing fire fighting companies they would literally let houses burn if you didn't pay oh it was the right a little after. is that yeah, true by him. the way yeah yeah it was after him 
he started the volunteer fire company because huh. you know obviously you don't want the city to burn down so it was a civically responsible thing to you know they would have a bellman or watchman they would call him and if there was a fire they a guy would sniff out fire all night and he would ring the bell and as a fireman you'd run to where that bell was the sound mm -hmm. and over time into the 1800s it was you had a bunch of competing fire companies hose houses they mm -hmm. called them because they're became fire insurance and if you paid to have fire insurance the fire company would not contain the fire to your house that's what the old roman method of firefighting was but try to actually put your fire out and do their best diligent work to do that so to save your house and they were only the insurance company the fire insurance company was only going to pay one hose house so if there were 12 hose houses there they would Beat each other up while wow. you know while the while the house burned down behind them. <laughs> That's it so so sick, it did happen. Sick their dogs on one another, shoot at one another. It's it's really well portrayed in the movie Gangs of New York, uh -huh. Leonardo DiCaprio. It's one of the things that you know as a historian when you watch TV, you're like, ah, oh, was that accurate? Was it you know more? than not things are not done accurate it's done very accurately in gangs in new york because they portray just that in that movie which is pretty cool i mean you know the uh, the other stories within the movie aren't necessarily completely you know it's, they're meant to entertain you yeah. but that background stuff is super cool wow. and accurate which is wow neat. Wow. But um, yeah, before before we go, though, I think the reason that you actually noticed us, I, you got the newsletter for yeah. our fundraiser. Yeah. And what we were asking people to do is if there was any chance with our tours, with Grim Philly Twilight Tours, that anybody was going to take a tour with us at any future point, whether it be this summer, this fall, or you know, 10 or 12 years from now, whenever. Mm -hmm you know, mm -hmm. no expiration. If they go onto our fundraiser page, which you can link to from right from our Facebook page, Grim Philly Twilight Tours, you can buy no expiration tickets and they are, there's no fees on them. We absorb the fees. They're actually a little bit cheaper than if you were to buy them on a normal basis. Mm -hmm. And our private tours are like a third of the price. And we give you like boatloads of extras. We extend the time. We'll give you exactly what you want. You tell us what you want. We'll give it to you. Uh, we do it in the fashion of the the spirit of outdoors with the responsible COVID behavior of socially distancing and that mm. kind of thing. Uh, but if this whole thing passes, we'll just we'll give you whatever you want. You know, we could do it in a bar. It doesn't matter <laughs> then. Uh, if you waited a year, if you waited two years and there's a vaccine and we're all good to go, we'll, you know, you, your, your purchase is never going to expire. Transfer it to somebody else. Gift it to somebody else. Nice. Gift it in 10 years from now. It's always there. But yeah, to be frank, we could use the income now because we're getting hammered with this thing and nobody's traveling. Nobody's coming out to these things. And like I said, the majority of our guides are just unemployed and mm -hmm. they don't qualify for unemployment either mm -hmm. because they're 1099 employees and it's, I see. it's part it's part time work. So it's we're we fell into a weird like we fell into the cracks, I guess, because we're not a we're not a corporation, right? Mm -hmm. we're like like we're small because we want to give that extra personal touch to things. Mm -hmm. And well, I mean, hell, I mean, if I if I could be Microsoft, I probably would be, though. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Uh, but yeah, we didn't get bailed out like some of the bigger corporations did. Uh, and our guides kind of fell through the cracks cracks as well because they don't qualify for unemployment either through the state so you know so we're trying to keep them working and we're trying to keep things afloat the best we can we just have to weather this covid storm and then we'll be through it on the other end of things yeah yeah, but, yeah so for viewers uh, um i'm gonna put this both on the history channel and the learn business channel but i will put a direct link to the fundraiser also so there's cool. 14 more days and yeah yeah there's probably like by the time it gets on the history channel maybe there's 12 more days we'll see i will say it when i can get these out but so That's definitely sweet, go, go. It's great, man. It's like, um, you, you're probably going to visit Philly one day, right? Think about it like that for viewers that aren't in Philly. You're probably going to visit Philly one day. So these tickets will just be there for you when you go to Philly, maybe in two years, maybe in two months, maybe in, yeah. And we'll mention you on our podcast too. We'll, yeah. we'll give a shout out to you for being super awesome and cool and, you know, absolutely. and helping out. I mean, 
I Philly's one of these cities. I'll just from my personal experience, if you don't go and explore it, it's gonna feel like a pit stop to New York City. But if you go appreciate the history, go really explore what Philly has to offer. It's a great city. And yeah. I lived in the New York's Philly, got a lot of history bubble for four years, right? So I didn't really appreciate <laughs> Philly. And, but then I worked. I worked at Fox Twenty Nine, the the station in Old City. Um, it's, yeah. it's on Third Street. Or so I yeah, you're I like worked, two blocks. From yeah, the Liberty Bell there. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I worked. I worked at Fox Twenty Nine, and that's when I was miserable there because you know local journalism. It, it's like it kills your mind. But I <laughs> I said one day I'm I'm gonna give Philly a chance. So I still ended up loving Philly because I I started doing stuff like this. I started exploring the history. I would go to Elfris Alley like every weekend just to chill there. Like that's what I would do. It was, it was that's a sweet so, like, place. It would get my mind to realize there's something more than just a miserable job that I had. <laughs> so, <laughs> and imagine living on Elfris Alley too. Like it's yeah. the oldest continually occupied street in British North America, yeah. and it's they're super small houses, but they go for maybe you know eight hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars, you know, yeah. and but they're but they're kind of small, you know, like real low ceilings, you know, but you go there because of the ambiance, but all day long, you just have tourists walk by yeah. your house. Yeah. You have people taking photo ops. And I, I've talked to some of the residents because we, we get back to the community too. Our tour guides and I will go volunteer at different places. And we volunteer on Elfers Alley is one of the places we do. They open the alley up uh, in people's homes like four times a year. Wow. And we volunteer there. And I talk to the residents and they're like, I'm just trying to bring my groceries in, you know? And like, I, like once a month, there's a photographer set up and, and, and somebody modeling, like sitting on my step. And I have to be like, you know, I appreciate that you like my neighborhood. Can I get in my house though? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> everything is so, you know, it's an alley. Everything is yeah. real tight, you know? Yeah. I mean, you can get one car in that alley and then it blocks the alley, you know, just yeah. to unload your groceries. Yeah. It's so, exactly. it, like you said though, it's, it's so quaint. It's so quaint and it's so beautiful. And that's the beauty of Philly. You go around Philly, you're going to find stuff like that. And Mm -hmm. Grim Philly Twilight Tours will help you find stuff like that. So, guys, again, (laughs) check out all the links, man. Check out all the links and check out the fundraiser. Cool, man. This has been absolutely amazing being on. Thank you for for having me on. And uh, anything I could do for you. As soon as I get my podcast a little bit more established, we will. Well, you're you're in Santa Monica, so we'd Mm -hmm. have to, you know, we'd have to. Skype again or Zoom. Yeah, exactly. I, I would love again. to do a series, especially on the History Channel. We could like just like one political figure, one topic. We just talk about it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, one topic, even even that whole um um Washington and bringing the slaves over to Philly. That could be a whole whole whole, whole video. So there's so much. There, it's never ending. You know, history and gritty, dark stuff. It's. Yeah. You know, it's never ending. It seems to me. I don't yeah, know. yeah. I mean, there definitely should be a um, an episode on whorehouses and stuff like that. I'm sure Philly had whorehouses. I'm, there's probably going to be like some crazy stories from that. There is. Yeah, yeah. There, there is, and you can look forward to. Yeah, we'll look that. forward to that. So for viewers, man, um, Joe's definitely going to be back. 